Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest in our conversation series, The Portal, which asks the question, if we're facing a new normal, what should that normal be? And how can we build a world which is fairer, more just and sustainable post pandemic? My name is Dr. Patrick Patak, and I'm the director of the Social Impact Lab, the University of Southampton's community for students to gain knowledge, build skills, and learn from experience to lead sustainable social change. And this show is not just a conversation between me and a guest, but a prompt for a broader conversation. So if you have any questions or comments, do join in. Post in the comments and we'll read them out. For the fifth in our series, we're humbled and honored to welcome a global leader and a personal role model of mine, Dr. Michael J. Sorrell. Michael was named in the top 50 global leaders by Fortune magazine and is the longest serving president in the 148 year history of Paul Quinn College in Dallas, Texas. Michael is one of the most decorated college presidents in America. He's been named higher education's president of the year by Education Dive, is the only three time recipient of the HBCU male president of the year award and Time magazine listed him as one of the 31 people changing the South. Washington Monthly identified him as one of America's 10 most innovative college presidents. Michael is also the recipient of the Dallas Bar Association's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Justice Award and the City of Dallas's Father of the Year Award. I've, I've got to hear more about that. He's received the Distinguished Alumni Award from Duke University, the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education and St. Ignatius College Prep in Chicago. Michael received his JD and MA in public policy from Duke University and his EdD from the University of Pennsylvania. While in law school, he was one of the founding members of the Journal of Gender, Law and Policy and served as the vice president of the Duke Bar Association. There's more. Michael was a recipient of a Sloan Foundation Graduate Fellowship, which funded his studies at both Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government as a Graduate Fellow and Duke. He graduated from Oberlin College with a BA in government, served as secretary treasurer of the senior class, was a two-time captain of the men's varsity basketball team and graduated as the school's fifth all-time leading scorer. So we have to talk about Last Dance. I mean, it's just gonna happen. It's gonna I mean, happen. You know, I, I am a, a hoop head, so I will not mind that conversation at all. <laughs> uh, President Soto served at, serves as a trustee or director for the Duke University School of Law, the Graduate School of Education at the University of Pennsylvania, JP Morgan's Advancing Black Pathways, Amity Bank, the Hockaday School, Dallas Foundation, and EarthX. Wow, I'm tired. <laughs> that's, a, that's an impressive roster of accomplishment, Michael, and welcome to the portal. No, thank you for the invitation. It is thrilling to be here. Excellent. Now, I want to, we always ask the question, we've been very UK centric, and I, but I want to ask, how has lockdown been for you as uh, people from the UK, we see what's happening around COVID and about the, the protests, and it kind of feels, it feels like a world away, actually, from our reality, but you, what's it been like, and what's it been like in mm. Dallas, and what's it been like for, for you, just personally? Um, you know, it, it's, it's, so let's talk about it just from the country standpoint first, right? Um, it, it's tough, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's tough because we are in this really, really unfortunate place in America where we have forgotten that which is supposed to unite us, right? We have, um, we have embraced tribalism uh, with the false idea that if I just focus on me, it somehow is going to make me feel better about who and what I am. And the reality of it is that's nonsense. It, it doesn't. Yeah. But it, it makes it really difficult to galvanize people for sustained periods of time for heavy lifts. And to defeat a global pandemic, to defeat a public health scare, you need people galvanized working together for sustained periods of time. And we don't have that, right? Um, and unfortunately for us, we, we have leadership that isn't really interested in galvanizing us, right? And so there's also this really nasty undercurrent where ignorance is seen to have been elevated to the same place as intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that somehow, if you point that out, it makes you an elitist, it make you an elitist, right? It makes you right, okay? I mean, that 
we we have to um, we we have to understand that there is a there is a benefit to working hard, developing oneself, especially in times of crises. So, with global health, with the pandemic, you, you can't depend on politicians. You have to depend on scientists, yeah. and you know people don't want to do that. So that part has made it difficult. Now, on a personal level, um, you know I have to be honest. It, it's been this bittersweet gift, right? Because I spend my days at home with my children and wife. Hmm. And my daughter's five. Um, and when she was born, you know, we were sort of, I mean, I was in it, you know, like things had just sort of ratcheted up. And my son is 10. And, you know, I mean, I've always been a college president since my children have been born. Right? Like hmm. it's, it's what they know, but it's been a little bit more difficult with my daughter to really kind of find a common ground because, you know, my son um, just rolls with me. You know, hmm. I mean, like his interests are aligned to mine. I've seen. He loves, he <laughs> right. loves sports, he loves, you know, he's an athlete. So, I mean, you know, we sort of, like we have our rhythms, we have our routines and my daughter, um, she's not really, she didn't really love it like that, right? I mean, she's five, so there's lots of time here, so we, we don't know what she's gonna love. But we hadn't had a chance to really, really spend time together and bond. And so, you know, a big reason why I decided to sit on the board of her school was so that I could, you know, spend more time and make sure she understands how much I love her things. But with this, I've been home more and she's home. And so she comes in, she hangs out in my office, we talk, uh, we dance, we do like all this cool stuff. And so if, the, if what comes out of this has been the opportunity to build this incredible relationship with her, to continue to spend extraordinary time with my son, um, to, you know, smile at my wife more, I don't want anyone to suffer. And I hate the fact that people have lost their lives as a result of this pandemic. Um, but I also am a person who believes in trying to find the good. Mm -hmm. And there is good in being able to strengthen your familial relationship. Yeah, no, that, I mean, I can, I can relate to some of that. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. I mean, you talk about the kids being at home and can coming in and, and dancing, which all sounds amazing, but is there a, is there a sense in which when you're working, you're guilty because you're not spending time with the kids and when you're spending time with the kids, you're guilty because you're not working? Have you kind of made peace with that? <laughs> An ongoing struggle. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's a work in progress, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I would tell you, for me, my, my kids are so wonderful about it. You know, now they'll come in and, you know, they'll kind of give me, we know, you have another call, you have another, you know, um, but I also never make them feel as if they can't come in even in the midst of the call. So my daughter right now is out by riding her bike. When she gets back, I suspect she will wanna come running in and she may stick her head in here, right? Cause she likes to climb up in my lap and she'll announce to you, she says, my name is Sage and I'm a tall five-year-old, right? Or, <laughs> we can't wait, we we'll look forward to that. Yeah, so, you know, I just, I, I try and um, I try and give them an understanding that no matter what it is I'm doing, no matter where I am in my day, they are the most important thing. You know, and I'm like that. My, my wife calls. Doesn't matter who I'm meeting with. Doesn't matter what I'm doing. I stop and I take that call. And you know, it's um, I never want to be someone that sends my family to voicemail. I just I don't want to be that guy. Wow. I am. Um... So I remember that when we met, we only met once actually, it was at a conference. And I remember you gave, yeah, you gave this amazing keynote. Well, it was a closing speech actually, wasn't it? And then um, I remember we were sat down and you got a call and it was from your son. And I think he just had a basketball game. I remember you, and I think he didn't, didn't, didn't do very well. Um, and uh, you gave him a pep talk. And I just, just remember thinking, I mean, firstly, that you can you can just that you did just stop everything, right? The call came in, that's a priority. 
but the way you talked to him was the way that it was the same kind of, and I talked about it in terms of integrity, that the message you give to everyone is the message you give to your family. And, um, and that was just very inspiring. So, and it's great yeah. to have someone who isn't, isn't, doesn't put family first, but is still very much singularly focused on their mission. And that's quite rare. So, well, um, it is, um, I, I do not pretend that I'm unaware of the blessings that I have. Right. I mean, I spend my days in the service of people and causes that I love. And there was, there's no guarantee that you get to spend your life that way. Right? Yeah. There's no guarantee that um, you will look up and that's the gift you've been given. <clears throat> and for me, um, I don't even want to take that for granted. And I just, I, I just want to be authentic and I want to be consistent in my authenticity. Mm. Okay. Um, you know, what? This, this would segue really nicely to a conversation about servant leadership, but I just wanted just to, just to go back to, to lockdown really. Um, yeah. And uh, has there been one habit or practice that's served you through this time? Uh, you know, when things are getting hard that you've kind of gone to and has become like a mainstay of your routine? Um, I would say a lot of it is exercise. I mean, I, I generally exercise anyway, but what the lockdown has allowed me to do is get back in my practice of early morning exercise. So I used to get up and when my son was born and he was young, I just get up and I walk for 45 minutes every morning. And that worked out pretty well. One, because you know, my wife took my son to school. We only had one child. Um, and then when when we moved and when I started, we had another child and I needed to take my son to school, we kind of got out of that habit. So I bought a bicycle um, during the coronation, which is what we call it at the college, right? We call it coronation. Yeah. And every morning um, I get up and I ride for about 45 minutes to an hour, which has been a great way of clearing my head and using it as sort of a thinking time. Um, unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, I took a spill on my bike. Turns out you should not try and answer your phone while riding your bike, right? Bad move. <laughs> seems like you would understand intuitively. <laughs> so, <laughs> who are you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Silly me. Uh, but I, uh, so I've had to let a couple of bumps and bruises heal, and I'll get back out on the bike next week. But um, right. that early morning exercise has been so helpful. Nice. Well, well, let's jump back into servant leadership because I really wanted to talk about talk about that. Um, could you say something about how? We Over Me evolved. So you're wearing, are you wearing We Over Me? Uh, is, that, is that a shirt you're wearing? Not, not today. Usually it is. Usually yeah. it is. Um, um, but not today. Yeah, um, so yeah could you just talk, about, talk about that and just about the four L's as well? Yeah. And, and, and why? Because I think, as you said, you talked about you're fortunate to have a job where you're in service. But leadership right now, especially in America, is very much not a servant leadership. Um, it's very self-serving. But do you, can you kind of just say something about why you think in terms of this new normal we're trying to bring about, why you think servant leadership is very important to that? Sure. So I, um, <clears throat> I grew up in a family where their expectations of me were made very, very clear. I, I was told that I was expected to lead, right? And that um, I was expected to be a voice for the voiceless. I was expected to leave places better than I found them. And um, I went to a Jesuit high school and the Jesuits believe in being men and women for others. And they believe in service. And the interesting part about this is, and this speaks volumes to just the environments that you put yourself and your family in, is I don't think that I ever really thought about when I was in high school, oh, you know, service. I, it was just expected of us, so we did it. 
Mm -hmm. right? And at each step along the way, it, it would, it's my default mechanism in a sense, right? And so I am, um, when I took the job with Paul Quinn, we really didn't have, we didn't have a foundation of values that was going to resonate in the marketplace moving forward, right? I mean, we were a struggling institution that had found a way to produce some, some really good people, but just because you can produce roses from concrete doesn't mean that people are gonna embrace you and fund you and, and all of that, like you need something else. And so, you know, as I sat down one day and it really was sort of over a series of days and tried to think about what, what are my values, right? Because I, I can't sell that which I don't believe. I can't sell that which isn't an integral part of my being. And so I thought about it. I said, well, the Jesuits told us to be men and women for others, right? So, you know, I, that, that, that and my parents could lead to love something greater than yourself, right? Um, my parents told me to leave places better than I found them. Uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I took a world history class and they talked about being Renaissance men and women and how those were individuals that, because of their accomplishments, they lived on beyond their eras. And I thought, might be kind of cool to be a Renaissance man. Right now, I don't know why at 13, I thought it would be cool <laughs> to be a Renaissance man. I, I can't, I, maybe just something about the way I was wired, right? But, um, and then the last one is, I'm really, and so that, created the L, you know, live a life that matters. Yeah. And then, you know, lead from wherever you are is a product of the fact that I'm just incredibly impatient. You know, I don't, I don't want to wait for my turn. Right? Mm. Hi everyone, I think we've just lost Michael temporarily, but we're gonna try and get him back. So just hold fire uh, and he should be back with us very, very soon. Hey, Michael, I hey, think I'm you just dropped off. Apparently there was a internet interruption at the house here and- um, <laughs> Okay. You know, sorry that about happens. that. That happens, yeah. Uh, uh, I, you know, I really was you know, um, and I thought that I didn't really know people were gonna take to it. And so they took to it. And then the we over me is just another product of being men and women for others. I mean, we, we needed something to communicate what our value proposition was going to be, that we were going to be people that laid it all on the line for what we believed in. And what we believed in was selflessness. What we believed in was the idea that we can band together and accomplish tremendous things for each other. Um, and that we were going to turn the institution outward and address the needs of the day. And that's where we came up with those things. Um, and very, very thankful that, that people, they do seem to have found a home. And even in this era of selfishness, um, I don't believe that selfishness will win. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I think, 
I think selflessness will lead, will win. Yeah. I think real leadership will win. It's a yeah. dark day for those things right now, hmm. but there's no question in my mind that when all the days are done, we will win. The arc of universe, yeah, bends towards justice. The you know what, as you was, you make it sound very intuitive, and and not easy but obvious. And you know, you know Paul Quinn is obviously a, an outlier, and uh, and that's pretty that's pretty clear. But as you were speaking, it made me think actually of the book that I recommended to you, if you remember, which was Matthew Said's Bounce. And, you know, he was talking about... Uh, actually. And, uh, yes, that's the one. That's the one, Bounce. I love this book. And I, I read it. And let me tell you something. It actually has influenced my parenting. Okay. Right? It, it is. I mean, I am such a proponent of that. But I keep going. I just wanted to let you know. Bought it, read it. It sits here on my desk. It is a very important book to me. I love that. I love that. Um, I'm grateful it was useful. The, um, I make it sound like I wrote the book. I didn't read the book. I didn't write the book, obviously. Um, but I'll take the credit. The, uh, <laughs> let me think about, so So those of you who don't know, Matthew Saeed's talking about, about this idea that it's nature rather than nurture. And what he kind of looks at is he looks at exceptional sports people mainly um, and, uh, and chess players and show that it's actually environment and that actually makes the difference. And and, ping pong. And, sorry? And ping pong. And ping pong, yeah. yeah. Where, he, where he was a table tennis player. And it made me think a lot about what you were saying about how when you grow up in that environment, you're saturated in that environment. It's the easy path is the path that you're on, that you've been given. You know, you're not actually doing a lot of heavy lifting there. You're in that environment. So you're going to follow, you're going to imbibe the values you've been given by your parents. Whereas if you haven't got that environment and you're trying to then kind of course correct when you're 18, 24, 30, that's, that's oh. much harder. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it makes me think you know, a, lot, a lot about what you're doing is you're kind of, you're making it easy for, your, for Paul Christian students to, to lead in that way because you're saying well, this is your environment we're going to immerse you in this you're going to lead by example and I, it just seems this is a really interesting extension of everything that Saeed talks about um, as a principle. You know, so, it, it, it's interesting right I um, mm. a couple of things that I'm trying to see where my notes on that part in the book are I mean here, here's what part of what I took from from the book is I mean number one you need opportunity Right, like you, you need an opportunity to be exposed to these things, right? So I love the table tennis example in the book where he, he talks about how, you know, he grew up in a neighborhood where he just, some of it was dumb luck. His, his parents bought a professional grade ping pong table. Yeah. He had a brother who was older who played. So the two of them could spend large amounts of time going back and forth with it. Uh, they went to a school where the gentleman who was responsible for the youth program in the country is the teacher. Yeah. Is the teacher, right? Yeah. And then he, a few blocks away, has a center. And so, you know, you've got all these kids in the area who have become great because iron sharpens iron. So you had opportunity, yeah. you had quality instruction, Right. And so, and you have mean, I guess opportunity could be mean. Right. And so, yeah. you know, and, and your competition. Yeah. Right. So it, it's, you know, when I think about it for the standpoint of what we're trying to do, we, we are trying to immerse people in an environment. We're providing them with the opportunity and we are challenging them. Yeah. We're challenging them with a way of saying, we want you to be great. We think you can be great. How are you going to be great? How are you going to accomplish the greatness that is within you? Now, some people want no part of it. Mm. No part of it. Like, I mean, they may say they do, but at the end of the day, they don't. They just want to be left alone to embrace the bad habits of their youth, right? And interestingly, those bad habits were brought to them by their environment. They were the things that they had the opportunity and had access to. Um, probably didn't have to have competition for it, right? But it's... So again, you know, and, and defeating that environment is tough because and whether or not you truly ever get out of it, a lot of it is based on whether or not you want to get out of it. 
And you could even succeed, but not succeed up to your potential because you don't have people who push you beyond that. I had a good friend of mine, brilliant. And, you know, had a dysfunctional family environment, right? And um, just he would have to be considered a success given that environment, right? He has a steady job. He's popular with his job. Um, you know, did, did he ever attain the academic potential that he had? No, he didn't, right? But it is undeniable that from whence he came, he came out ahead, Yeah. right? And the challenge is how do you, how do you in a sense cheat the process? Hmm. You know, like how do you, how do you cheat the process? And, um, you know, I think about my family. My dad was incredibly bright, but he never went to college. He grew up in a single parent home in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and they were poor. And he, you know, really wasn't that interested in school, but he was really smart. And so when, by the time he and my mother got married, he was in his fifties, um, they built this thriving restaurant business. But my dad never necessarily had the super hunger, right? He had he had the hunger, like, I want to be okay. I want to be here. It was my mother who had gone to school who had a, a stronger ambition. She wanted to be here. And she kept pushing the floor, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I think about all the things around us, when I think about my students, when I think about just the communities we serve, we have to be the floor pusher, right? Like, we have to be the people that are pushing the students up towards the city. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's exhausting. It's exhausting for all parties involved. Yeah. It's yeah, it kind of reminds me, and this is, uh, this is a segue that I think we can, that I think I can, I can do um, with credibility is, is Michael Jordan. And um, we were just, you know, watching Last Dance and I was telling my, my, my team early this afternoon about the way that he pushed everyone around him. And be the very best they could be and clearly some of them didn't want to be there I mean you could be a professional basketball player playing for the Chicago Bulls still doesn't mean you want to reach the level of greatness that Michael Jordan did well, and, and, and in fairness you already are great right yeah, like yeah. compared to the general population you are already great yeah it's whether or not you can distinguish yourself in that special pool yeah 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 exactly exactly but you're right it's you, that bit you can't you can't you can't teach right you you want that or you don't want it but there's um but yeah it's cre creating those environments I, I i love that idea of cheating that cheating that system because it's so deeply ingrained and i mean that's privilege right we're talking about a system of privilege and um that's hard to dismantle so I, think it's, I think it's interesting i don't know if i think of it as privilege hmm. right although it's certainly there's an element of privilege to it um, because maybe the privilege is the right to choose. Hmm. Yeah. Or maybe that's maybe that's the privilege. Um, but I think I think as I, I really try and process this, I I think it is so important that I mean I think about the last dance, right? Just hmm. to jump up for a second. I think about all the things that we saw about Michael Jordan, and I think about something. What a lot of people don't know is I had a sports, so I was in the sports business before I became a college president. Okay. And one of the things I had done is I ran an event called the Global Games, where we used to bring in the best players, from, young players from around the world, and they played, and I would pick the American team, and I ran the event. And so um, one of my good friends, one of my teammates from college, is now the president of the Orlando Magic. He came to the games because, you know, we had that kind of talent. All the NBA scouts came. And he brought one year the brain doctor with him. And so I'm sitting in the stands with the brain doctor and my teammate. And we're looking at one of these players. And he said, that player is never going to be very good. He's mm -hmm. not going to be successful at the highest level. 
And you know, we're sort of like, why not, right? Like, I mean, that seems kind of harsh. What, what, what are you talking about? He said, and he ran through some characteristics to observations and I was blown away. And he said, let me tell you something else. He talked about some other people. He said, Michael Jordan is the rarest of personality types. He's the rarest of like his brain wiring. He said he is, if he had lived in the time of war, he would have been a supreme warrior. Mm -hmm. He said like the level of ruthlessness, the single-minded pursuit, he goes through the whole thing. He said he is perfectly suited for things that emulate the characteristics and the behavioral patterns of war. He said, conversely, he is perfectly ill-suited for peace. <laughs> and he said, he did, he said oh, I mean, it was fascinating, right? You can and see that. Said, you can see, I mean, and that's why I think it's so fascinating because he said, when his playing days are done, he will never truly be happy again. Mm -hmm. He said, he will try to be happy. He will be happy. In a he said, but he exists. His wiring exists for the constant battle and the constant pursuit. Yeah. And if we are honest and we sort of look at everything that we know now, everything that we've seen if you think about some of the things that he said and did yeah. in, in the last dance yeah I, I, I think my i think my friend's friend was right i think the brain doctor was right yeah for sure he's a warrior he's a warrior um i i realize we've um you kind of gone away from my question list, and that's great. That's how it should be. This is the best. This is the best episodes. I just want to just say hi to everyone who's just tuned in. This is the portal from the Social Impact Lab, and we're in conversation with Dr. Michael J. Sorrell, talking about how to lead in the new normal. So please do post your comments and questions. I want to just uh, kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about. Black Lives Matters and the protests in the US as it relates to your students? Because I know a large proportion of your students, is it is it 25% are from Chicago, which is your, is that um, right? I have something, it's a high proportion. 45%, but should we have a significant student population from Chicago? Yeah, yeah. and there's it's been- It's your hometown. It's your hometown, yeah. Um, and, and that's been one of the epicenters, epicenters of, of the protest. What's, what's your message been to them have you been I mean is it a difficult line to walk for you because see they've got you know righteous anger but obviously you don't want them to be arrested and um so what's how have you how have you walked that line so I you know hasn't really been that difficult for me mm -hmm. because I support them yeah. I think they are where they should be if they want to be on the front lines if they want to fight this fight I'm proud of them. We support them. If you know, if they wind up arrested, we'll bail them out. Um, I I don't know where else they would be because their experiences have been such that this is the manifestation of, of what they've encountered in their life. Right. And no, I I, I get it. Yeah. I get it. I think now what I'm most concerned about is the exposure that the protests have for COVID. Mm. I'm really concerned about that. Yeah. Um, because you know, man, I, mean, I, you know, I was on the phone with one of them yesterday who has COVID now because of the protests. And, you know, when I watched the protests, I was, I, I was overwhelmed by the power, but I also in the, Right there after the the um, the joy that I felt about people using their voices was this deep concern because there's no way to make that amount of people for that long safe. Yeah, and in this country, you know, we we just haven't done a good job of keeping people safe. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's uh, pretty pretty obvious to anyone who's been watching. I know in the UK we've had a lot of it's divided the country because I'm not saying the stakes aren't as high as in the US, but but I mean they're not quite as as high. It's not 
policing is terrible and is and is and is and is and there are lots of racist outcomes we've got the same kind of structural racist racism um that you guys have but um we've still seen protests at large i mean in london in birmingham in bristol huge protests and people still saying are people saying well but you're putting lives in danger and not just their lives but then everyone they come in contact with and it feels a little bit like um people who support the protests have been saying people those who are critiquing it crit criticizing it don't quite understand why they're protesting and actually for people who are protesting they understand the risks the risks are worth taking right now um and that's difficult isn't it when people you kind of say well this, these are the risks but people say well you know what this fight is big enough significant enough we're going to keep going anyway well and i think it also speaks to just what people's lives have been like right i mean so yeah. Yeah. think about how angry you must be how unhappy you are with the state of affairs that you are willing to jeopardize your health to advance the cause. Yeah. And by the way, that's how any great causes succeed, right? There are people willing to pay outsized, what others would see as outsized prices for success. For mm. them, they don't see any other way. That makes, that's a really nice, nice way of framing it. Do you, do you think, and this is kind of talking about this question of leadership, do you think the leadership in terms of Black Lives Matter is the leadership that's going to that's going to create the kind of transformational change we need to see? Or do you think, because I know uh, Barack Obama, you, know, you, you posted the thing about um, President Obama talking about it can't be protest or politics, it's got to be both. Uh, do you think that the protest in the US in particular is transitioning to that phase of politics in the right way? Or are you kind of worried that the momentum might collapse? What are your kind of thoughts there? Um, you know, I think I think we're looking at the let me put it like this. I think it's a false choice to think that it's either or, right? It's always both and. Mm. You need the street as a battering ram for the boardroom. Right now, rarely do you have individuals that are adept at both. You know, I mean, some of the best negotiators are not really people you want to put in front of 10,000 people, right? That's okay, you don't have to be. One of the mistakes people make is they assume that in the civil rights movement, uh, there was just this uniformity and everybody did the same thing. That, that's, that's not how it was. I mean. Yeah, you see pictures of Dr. King marching, but that wasn't all Dr. King did was march. He wasn't even the primary marcher, right? Like he, what he did was made possible because other people showed up day in, day out, day in, day out. They were the battering ram. And then yeah. he came in. Yeah. And, and, you know, also then you had Malcolm X who scared the bejesus out of people, right? So he created an environment where, you know, Malcolm could kind of sit back and say, you can either talk to me or you see what Malcolm's talking about. Mm. And mm. I, I think in in this context, I don't I don't know. I, the other thing about it is I don't know if you have to produce. Um, this is a different era. Mm. Right. I don't know if you have to produce the same kind of thing to have credibility as you did back then. Yeah. Well, I'm yeah. not sure that's, that's, that's needed or, or it's the best way to go forward. Yeah. And I guess this is all new territory as well. Right? We don't, you know, we never lived through this kind of moment before. So the past is no indicator of the future. So it's. <laughs> Have you ever seen it? <laughs> yeah, we haven't seen it. Yeah. Are you optimistic though, Michael? I mean, if I, you know, is your, is your, is your, is your inner optimist winning over your inner pessimist if there is an inner pessimist? Um, I am reserving all optimism until after the presidential election. Okay. Right? I mean, yeah. If, if an optimistic result is produced, then I'm optimistic. If the wrong <laughs> yeah. result is produced. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, I've, we've got a question about that at the end. Um, 
you know, you've you've said you said in previous articles and, and, and videos that nothing is ever won easily, and you know the phrase "there is no testimony without a test," and um, we did say that revolutionary work turns out is hard. Um, <laughs> what a surprise! Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> Who knew? Um, the can you can you tell us about some of the forces of the of the incumbent power? And the old normal that you think, because you, I guess you've been fighting that for PQC for since you started, right? But they're still there. And what are these? What are the what are the forces of incumbent power and orthodoxy? Not just in, in higher education. I think it'd be good to kind of speak to that because you said this should be a, a kind of a a turning point. That COVID shouldn't just be, you know, how quickly can we resume business as usual? But it should be now we have to really rethink our business models. So. Um, and the way we operate and metrics, perhaps. What do you think some of those forces are um, and how should we overcome them? Well, um, let me, can you repeat the question one more time? Because I want to make yeah. sure that I, I get to the heart of it. So the, the, the question is, what are some of the forces of incumbent power and orthodoxy in higher education in particular that you think is going to keep things try, is try, going to try and preserve the status quo yeah so here's the thing um during slavery with harriet tubman there's this great quote i don't know whether she said it or not it's attributed to her um but she did say it um i love it but basically people pointed out how many slaves she freed, right? And Harriet's response was, I could have freed many more if they'd even known they were slaves. Mm. I say that in this context because in higher education, so many people think the only people worth being or listening to are a small fraction of schools that are highly selective with large endowments. Right. And they, I mean, people talk about, oh, there's another way, there's another way. But ultimately, if any of those schools came calling, those people would be like, I'm out of here. I'm <laughs> going to work at those places. And the reality of it is, there's so many more people, like my school, than like the top 10 schools. The majority of schools don't have billions of dollars in endowment. The majority of schools, don't have you know, Nobel laureates on their staffs. The majority of people can't afford to pay seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year to go to school. Um, that's just not, it's not the reality. It's very few people's realities, if you turn it out. And so we have to decide whether we really want to serve the students or we want to serve ourselves. If we want to serve the students, then we push past the ideas of the gilded class and look for a more egalitarian model, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think just because you are at, hold on, Mike, you okay? I, I don't think just because you are at one type of institution that, that makes you qualified to speak to every type of institution. Yeah. Not at all. Turns out, you know, one of the greatest quotes I've ever heard somebody say was it was an older uh, HBCU president, and HBCU is a historically black college. And he was having a conversation with a colleague of his who was at the predominantly white institution not far from their campus. And he told the guy, he said, listen, the reality of it is, I could do your job, but you couldn't do mine. Right? That's what the HBCU president was saying to the majority. Of and so, hmm. I think one, I think that's true. Two, I think that part of what that hammers home is this idea that maybe listening to the folks who are represent this yeah. small segment hmm. doesn't advance our cause, but we then have to have the courage to say, I'm not interested in that model. I'm not interested in being them. I'm interested in serving the people who really 
are coming to my school and the, who represent the majority of our society. Yeah, I can. Yeah, that's that's a, that's, that's really important, and and it seems. And I guess it also talks about metrics, right? That we need. I mean, I'm guessing at Paul Quinn, you don't have the you don't look at the same metrics and league tables as you do would do at Duke. So that's um, we're so driven by that, right? By metrics in higher education right now, and it's mm -hmm. uh, it's distorting what we do, isn't it? So, um, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Um, I know you're pressed for time, so but I did want to get a couple of questions, and that's okay. Um, yeah, we've got a we've got a question here from uh sarah so sarah's asking um what values are most important to you as a leader um and there's a second question which is there's a lot of anxiety for new students starting college university this year due to the pandemic and what would your advice be to them which i guess is um could be interpreted as how would you manage the anxiety or also <laughs> would you encourage students to defer but i guess yeah I nice. um so I think honesty is the most important leadership characteristic, right? I think transparency. Yeah. I, I tell people all the time, um, you should never lead people you cannot love. Yeah. Because when great. you do, you will not make the sacrifices necessary to do what is, is right by them. Um, so that, that's the first thing, be authentic, be honest, be transparent. Um, now, the question of the fall is a fascinating one because so many schools are just determined to come back to campus yeah. and that they can just sort of will their way past the realities of a global pandemic. <laughs> yeah. okay? um, I believe in trusting the science. I respect the virus. I want to keep the virus off my campus and out of my life. <laughs> okay. I don't. I don't see how you do that and you know, ignore the realities of what this virus is. Um, so I, I can't tell people what to do in terms of go to school, don't go to school. Uh, what I can tell them is think for yourselves. Hmm. Think what risk you can be comfortable with that your child can be comfortable. Yeah. And then work not to put yourselves in that type of harm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Are you, are you, are you worried at all as a college president about about in intake for next year? Have you modeled all, all of this, and is it something that yeah. plays on your mind? But I mean, we decided that we were going to scale down the size of the incoming class because we didn't see how we could serve them as well as we did. So um, we think that that was the right thing to do. I feel good about that decision. Um, but it doesn't mean I don't think about all the other things that go with it. Doesn't mean I'm not concerned about other things. Uh, but the other thing about it is I worry about enrollment every fall, every semester, every year. Yeah, um, because we're smaller and we made a decision to be smaller. But I think, um, I think if you're a parent, you should ask yourself just some common sense questions. Mm. And if your common sense questions lead you to what's behind door number one, okay, I'm willing to bet the common sense questions will lead you to what's behind door. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Well said. Um, okay, I'm going to go with one last question before we wrap up. Um, from Thea. So you're an example to us all. Uh, you said that we are navigating a dark time now where selfishness seems to be winning against selflessness. Before it gets better, and in order for it to get better, we have to navigate this dark time. How can we, as individuals right now, try to make sure that at least in our close environments, selflessness wins against selfishness? Um, keep making selfless choices. Yeah. Even in the face of discouragement, even in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary that it doesn't work, it does work. It mm. does work. 
and we have to push back. And no one said it was going to be easy. No one said that all of a sudden, magically, people are going to embrace you. They're going to embrace your idea because now you're so. It doesn't work like that. Evil doesn't give up without a fight. I mean, evil just doesn't sit around and say, oh, <laughs> you have a really good idea. I quit. <laughs> That's not <laughs> <laughs> That's, not how it works. That's not how it works. <laughs> you have to root evil out. You have to attack it. You have to keep coming for it. And even when you think you defeated it, you have to know it's just a pause. Yeah. So you have to keep making the right decision. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Selfish choices, selfless choices, even own the moment. To say. Um, I'm going to ask one. I've got one question. I'm going to ask Michael before uh, before we wrap up. But so it's a, there are a couple of ifs, um, but they're not necessarily big ifs. If Joe Biden wins, and if he offers you the role of education secretary, would you take it? Oh, I never dance before I hear the song. Okay, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Yeah, because you might be busting a move to a completely different different beat, and that's not. <laughs> not cool. You don't want to cool. be that. You don't want to be that guy, right? <laughs> Doing the Running Man to classical music. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh man, I could, Michael. I could talk to you for hours, and actually, I've got so many things I want to talk to you about. But maybe, hopefully, we could pull you back for part two at some point when this That'd is done. Cool. That'd, That'd be amazing. Cool. Um, Thank you so much, Michael. You can find Michael all over the internet, but on Instagram and Twitter at Michael Sorrell. And you can find his TED and other talks on YouTube simply by searching his name and you'll get a lot of hits. If this is your first time tuning into our events, welcome to the Social Impact Lab family. You'll find more resources on social impact opportunities and careers on our website, sutton.ac.uk forward slash SI Lab. If you like this episode, show us some love by giving us a like, a love, post a comment, or share our next event with your friends and loved ones. Remember, you can watch this video again by coming back to this page and watching our videos where you can also find our first four episodes. We're taking a little break, but we'll be back on Tuesday 30th with the inspirational Elsa Da Silva to talk about gender equality in the new normal. Some of you may have noticed we've been relatively quiet on Black Lives Matter so far, and that's simply because we didn't want to put out a superficial response for the sake of being visible. Uh, someone who's been involved in anti-racism here in the UK for 35 years, I know this is a lifelong struggle and we're not going to win the world in a week. Shortly we'll be launching some new resources and guidance on how you can make a long-term sustainable contribution to dismantling systemic racism. Until the next time, stay safe and take care of yourselves and join us in building a new world in which we can all thrive. All right, bye everyone. <laughs>